All right, um, I think we can start now. Um, welcome everybody to our last uh, event on our series, uh, the USA and the world. This is our fourth uh, webinar on this topic. And today we are going to talk about what the election means like for the whole world. And uh, we know that the United States role in the world has undergone some profound changes lately especially its status of an international leader, the great power in a unipolar world and a global agenda sector has been increasingly questioned and challenged, both domestically and internationally. One can speak of an ongoing global structure shift where transformations within and, there, and around the United States won close attention and careful analysis. So this is now our fourth event. Uh, we already talked about transatlantic relations, the impact, the direct impact after the US elections, but also the USA in this armament. So I'm very happy that today we try to go to the bigger picture, to the whole geopolitical backstory. Is, uh, Waseda Institute for Advanced Studies in Tokyo. Welcome. And I would also like to welcome, of course, uh, Hannes Svoboda. He's the president of the International Institute for Peace. And he also used to be an MEP uh, uh, in Brussels for more than 18 years. And of course, last but not least, uh, I also welcome Heinz Gärtner, who actually, to whom this whole idea of this series goes back to. Heinz Gärtner is a professor at Vienna University, and he's also the chair of the advisory board of the International Institute for Peace. Uh, uh, welcome. Stephanie, Hans. you should uh, uh, introduce uh, Luisa. We didn't hear you before again. So, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. sorry. So let me introduce again uh, Luisa Bialasiewicz. Uh, I'm very happy to see you here virtually. Uh, she's from the University of Amsterdam and a uh, professor of European governance. And I'm glad that I now um, was able to introduce you, Leslie, again, because I would like uh, to start with you. Uh, maybe just for an information for our participants, we are going to start with small inputs from our panelists. But then I would, of course, also like to encourage you to ask your questions, submit your questions in the queue and a um, um, button down there in Zoom, and I will then afterwards go through it, and I hope we have an interesting discussion. Um, Luisa, I would like to start with you and um, talking about uh, geopolitics. I mean, since geopolitics uh, were the main factor during the Cold War, we then somehow saw a decline for several years. Um, would you say that after Russian forces seized Crimea in 2014, China making aggressive claims in its coastal waters, Japan responding with an increasingly assertive strategy of its own, or also Iran trying to use its alliances with Syria and Hezbollah to dominate the Middle East, that old-fashioned power plays are back in international relations. While on the one hand we are shifting from a unipolar to a multipolar world and at the same time witnessing also a decline in multilateralism, what do you think does the election in the US imply for geopolitics? Do you, would you say we are now seeing the return of geopolitics in the years to come? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this panel. I've had a chance to follow some of the other events. So um, I hope, as you were saying, that we can you know, kind of zoom further out with, with this last discussion and consider the geopolitical implications. So um, since there are members of this panel as well, who certainly are much more regional experts than I am, um, I, you know, I guess I want us to think more about what you're saying. If this is, you know, if with the election of Joe Biden, we are witnessing a return to geopolitics. I guess one thing that is important to say, um, and you know, I'm not the only one saying this, if there's one way in which the election has been characterized across, I think, the globe is for a kind of desperate return, um, desperate desire for a return to normality, whatever that normality may be. And I think one of my favorite depictions, cartoons um, of the election was this idea of, you know, kind of seeing the globe from space and this giant sigh of relief, like, ah, oh, yeah. We're back to a context that somehow we can make sense of. And of course, this doesn't only have to do with Biden's election, but more generally the pandemic moment that we're in, which is a very uncertain moment and in which a desire to return to some sort of 
normality, um, to familiar frames, to familiar ways of making sense of the world is, is clearly understandable. Now, um, the reason I'm saying this is because I think the, the desire to actually return to a reading of international relations of the world through a geopolitical lens is very much part, to my mind at least, of that desire to returning to um, a sense of normality, of making sense of international politics in, in um, a particular set of frames, of understanding who are the good guys and who are the bad guys um, and how do we respond to them. Something that, you know, and I don't need to say it in this context, was entirely appended in the Trump years, where foes and villains could be reframed as partners, you know, with one tweet, literally, um, with one tweet and a photo op, usually, and I'm thinking of North Korea, but not only. Um, something that, of course, uh, has had a profound destabilizing effect, not just on the relations of the United States with the rest of the world, but also more broadly for all of us of how we were making sense of international politics. That coupled with you know, what has been described very much as a kind of transactional approach to um, geopolitics uh, that the Trump administration has favored, that also um, upended past alliances, past commitments. So I think when we begin kind of thinking of what will come next, we need to be aware of what I think is very much a desire, not just on the part of foreign policy elites, but also popular publics for a world of which we can make sense somehow. Um, and geopolitics or geopolitical framing certainly uh, provides that. Now, um, I'm a political geographer by training, um, and I you know, kind of feel keenly aware that I'm speaking to you with a map behind me. So in terms of kind of embodying the geopolitical gaze, um, it's certainly there. And um, whether, you know, this is something that we can expect of the next years, um, certainly uh, a Biden presidency um, is much more reassuring. And Biden himself very much comes out of um, that sort of geopolitical tradition. I mean, he has very, you know, been, been a long part of the U.S. foreign policy community. I mean, he served on and chaired the Senate um, Foreign Relations Committee for, I think, 30 years. Um, but let's remember that he was also very much a proponent of, you know, you were asking whether we're seeing a return of Cold War geopolitics. Um, you know, um, he was... Um, a very vocal proponent first of you know, interventions in the Western Balkans and the most vocal proponent of the expansion of NATO. Um, and I'll return to that. Um, what I was uh, struck by earlier this week was an interview with Henry Kissinger that was reprinted across a number of European newspapers as part of this kind of leading European newspapers alliance. So I think it appeared in Die Welt, in El Pais, La Repubblica, Gazeta Wyborcza in Poland. Um, and Kissinger was being asked, you know, what uh, Biden geopolitics would look like. And um, he has known Biden for a very long time from when uh, Biden first arrived to make uh, to be part of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, and what he said that you know even though at times they were in disagreement, he was confident that Biden would you know kind of return to taking geopolitics seriously and to pursuing importantly a common geopolitical vision um, uh, with the EU because that was part of the question vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China. And, you know, I mean, if we want to kind of think of a revival of old style geopolitics, there's nothing better than wheeling out Henry Kissinger, you know, <laughs> to talk about, you know, what, uh, what a Biden presidency should look like. But I want to kind of get us to think, I guess, further on what this could mean. Um, I mean, what do we mean by a, a return um, of geopolitics? As I said, part of it is, you know, um, a return to familiar frames of reference, of reading um, international relations within um, that sort of understanding. Um, 
But it can also be, I think, a concern. I mentioned already that we should remember that um, you know, Biden was one of the most active proponents of NATO expansion. In fact, when the Partnership for Peace is first launched, Biden is the head of the fact-finding group that travels to Poland, to Hungary, um, to Czechoslovakia, to you know, kind of push this project forward and indeed um, is, you know, kind of presents, it comes back um, to the United States and gives some, you know, quite impassioned addresses, arguing the case for expansion, saying, we must do this, we, the United States, must push for expansion, because this is a way of welcoming these states back to Europe, something that the Europeans aren't doing quite quickly enough. And I'm, you know, I'm, I've managed to dig up some of his quotes from those years, and it's interesting. And I'm saying this because, Biden's position on NATO expansion in 94, 95, 96 is being seized again now as, um, you know, kind of an interpretative lens to understand or to guess what his administration will do vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And it has already been seized by Russian um, disinformation sources. So um, I was looking at the wonderful new um, um, a website that the EU has set up, the EU Disinfo website. And if those of you who are not familiar with it, have a look at it because they do a kind of rolling review of the press, of various sources, um, Russian language, but not only, mostly actually um, non-Russian language press, um, looking at, you know, kind of the threats posed um, by, um, you know, uh, a Biden presidency to what's, you know, future developments of relations with Ukraine, but also what will be happening in EU states. So I think it's interesting how it's being conceived. Um, I want to make one more point because I don't want to take too much time, because I think on the one hand, we see this kind of return to geopolitical frames. But if, you know, if, um, if I were to kind of read this from my own perspective, I really wonder if this will be a priority, certainly in the early months or the first year of the Biden presidency, given the pandemic, which is worsening and worsening um, by the day. I mean, the, you know, what is happening in certain U.S. states, I mean, it's, it's frankly shocking, um, and I mean, I think that will be and has already been a stated priority, but also um, domestic divides and a domestic geopolitics. And I think what is really interesting um, is that, you know, the battle, the enemies are being identified, first of all, within and the sort of geopolitical language that, you know, and, and uh, you know, we were talking about the return of these tropes. I mean, they're returning, they have already returned throughout the election, but they're being reenacted on the domestic front. Um, so identifying communists and socialists in America rather than abroad. Um, but, you know, as an, as an observer for many years of U.S. politics, and you know, I, um, I grew up in the U.S. for part of also of my academic career. Um, what you know, what we see emerging right now is is quite striking. I mean, two you know various newly elected senators, you know, kind of. Um, the, the famous um, assertion from the new senator from Alabama, who was noting just a few days ago how um, his father had traveled to liberate Paris from, quote, socialism and communism in 1944. And, you know, that, that this, this is the sort of, you know, kind of domestic battleground using geopolitical visions um, as well. Um, I think that that will be much more of a preoccupation um, than external engagement, certainly in the first months. But I'm, as I said, conscious of my time. So I will pause here, but I, you know, I'd be very happy to come back to some of these points later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louisa. I think you already gave us some some very good key points, and I would now uh, like to go uh, to Hannes because, um, um, as you mentioned, also the U.S. and European Union did not really, after the Cold War, did not focus so much on on geopolitics, but especially after 2014, I would say it somehow came a little bit back. But before, it was more like topics like trade liberalization, nuclear non-proliferation, 
human rights, rule of law, like climate issues, so more on this multilateral approaches. But of course, we saw then, especially under the Trump administration, a decline, and also especially a de decline in, in the transatlantic relations, which were, by the way, of course, not invented by Trump. So claims have been there before. But Hannes, from your perspective, you have been working several years in the European Union. We know about the difficulties when it comes to decision-making processes. It's 20 seven states, 28 states, it depends. I mean, uh, how do you see, are we going after after now it, when Biden then is becoming president? Um, would you say that our relationship will be restored? And what will this mean like for cooperation on a global level? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephanie. First of all, I want to take up some points uh, of Louisa and that goes in the direction, and this is partly an answer to, to your question, it will be not a return, it will be a step forward, um, mixing different elements. Uh, first of all, Trumpism is to stay here. Even if Trump is no longer president, the whole ideology, the whole uh, opposition against uh, an open society and so on will stay. It didn't start with Trump. If you look to the Tea Party and the influence of the Tea Party and uh, what they said already at that time, you can read it with uh, Obama and his new book, uh, what he said about him, uh, you know, describing him like an, an ape or a monkey and, and so on. So many of these elements are here. And Biden's first job will be, of course, how to fight this internal enemy uh, and this internal geopolitics. Secondly, of course, the pandemics, was also mentioned by Louisa, so I think he will be very much uh, have to be engaged in domestic policies beyond what he would like to do as a foreign policy man. Secondly, of course, I think, uh, interesting enough, Trump and Obama were not so different in foreign policy, in, in, in the wordings, of course, much, but in pleading for less military intervention, on and even withdrawing the troops. It was Obama who started that, and it was Trump who continued it. Um, and uh, Biden, of course, has uh, been part of the decision-making. Sometimes he was on the other side than Obama. Uh, but anyway, I think he has to learn that there is no, no strong sentiment, no strong feeling in the U.S. for going again into interventionism like it was in Afghanistan and Iraq and um, more or less in, in Libya with all these non-successes or disasters, if you could say. And I think even if Trump now, because he, he wants to do something, uh, planned maybe uh, an intervention in Iran, he didn't do it uh, until perhaps the last minute when he just maybe thought uh, this is the only thing now he can save his, his image. And uh, so, in, in fact, I think uh, United States, and I hope, of course, as well, but I think also the United States did learn from the two presidencies that you can survive and they can have some influence even if you don't uh, go uh, into the military field and uh, go into an intervention. So, yes, it will be, again, a bit more multilateralism. Uh, for example, if you go for climate change, if you do a climate change policy, you must go multilateral. Uh, and here is a big bridge between European Union and the United States. Um, and we can do something also in countries like in, in Brazil, if you think about the Amazonas area where uh, Trump and Bolsonaro have been on the same line. Now, Bolsonaro and some of these people lost the big boss uh, in Washington, and you have to change. And that also means that China policy gets a new element. Trump will, of course, continue to, to compete with China and to uh, fight for more equal uh, trade terms and uh, fight against, of course, of Chinese, let's say, imperialism or expansionism in the South China Sea. But on the other hand, if he really wants to do something on climate change, he needs China, because China is the biggest um, uh, country or the, with the biggest emissions of uh, uh, the, this dangerous uh, climate uh, gases and consequences. So Biden, for what I think, will have to combine some strong policies 
in, for example, against China, but at the same time, open some channels of discussions where it is necessary. Heinz probably will speak also about Iran, and here I think it will be the same. It will try to go back into some agreement, but not the same agreement as it was before, with some extension on the missile issue and on the stability in the region. And that also means uh, the relationship to Europe, because all these elements would change the relationship between the US and Europe. If you have a more sophisticated China strategy, it means you have a stronger dialogue and uh, let's say cooperation with Europe. If you have even an extended, but nevertheless in the core uh, continuation of the agreement, nuclear agreement in the, brought in or uh, decided in Vienna with Iran, it means you have a better cooperation with Europe. And the same of course is especially in, in the climate issue. So I think it will be a new form, learning from especially Obama, but also in some way from Trump, having uh, a better style, a better communication, a better dialogue, uh, but also insisting, for example, also Biden will insist that Europe does more for uh, its defense. The quarrel is inside Europe, if you look between the discussion between Macron, non-discussion between Macron and the Minister of Defense in, in Germany. So the, the internal fights in Europe will be stronger because we don't have a you know, crazy man somewhere in Washington, but we have a serious man in Washington who is demanding more contributions, offering, of course, more cooperation. So I think, yes, it will be a new style, and I think uh, we can hope for um, uh, U.S. policy, which is more reliable again, but it will be not one which is making life too easy for Europe. This will not happen. Thank you very much, uh, Hannes. So you especially also mentioned the dividing lines within the U.S. political system, but also within the population. This is also what Luisa said. So maybe in the beginning, the, the focus will be on domestic issues. But of course, uh, let's hope that also then Heinz later will talk also about this leadership question, this international leadership role the U.S. has been having in the last years. And it was a little bit challenged due to the Trump administration. But you also mentioned the China policy. And um, I'm very happy that now we can uh, talk to Pascal Lotus, who is now sitting in Tokyo. And of course, I would like uh, to ask you about how China and Japan, especially also the, these countries there, how do they approach global topics? We know about the shift from the U.S. towards the Asian region is not really new. I mean, this is not have been done by, by Trump, but I mean, we also know that the, this trade war with China really reached its peak. And also now when we consider this, um, the, that last week, 15 countries of the Asian Pacific region have been formed the world's largest trading bloc, covering nearly a third of the global economy. And we also know that the U.S. initially was uh, should have been part partnering in this, but now it's out. So uh, what do you say, like, how does, what does this mean for, for China's influence also in the region? Does this have an impact on multilateralism? And what would you say, what is your, your stance on, on all these issues from a view from the Asian countries there? The floor is yours, Pascal. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And um, I, I, find, I find this a very fascinating discussion. Maybe what I can add from here without being myself, of course, I'm not involved in any of this, but what I can hear, for example, from a couple of diplomats that I was able to talk to two years ago, um, the most interesting thing at the moment is the timing of the free trade agreement that you just that you just mentioned, the, the, the R, RCEP, that is now, it's a huge free trade agreement. It is not entirely as comprehensive as the original TPP was uh, was conceptualized, right? And the TPP got kind of, we all thought it was killed off in 2016 when Mr. Trump uh, took the United States out. And then interestingly, a year later, uh, Mr. Abe in Japan kind of took the initiative to revive it or to to, to rescue it. And we have now the kind of the, um, the follow-up um, trade agreement that also got, gained the uh, necessary signatures to then come into force. I mean, it changed its name slightly. It's now the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that is here um, with the original members that, that were part then of the negotiation, except for the United States. And what two years ago 
South American diplomats told me is that, you know, when we negotiate this or when this is being negotiated, the United States is not a partner of it anymore. But of course, we ask them, <laughs> of course, we consult. So there is an expectation. There was an expectation already two or three years ago that the United States would come back to this. And my big question is, will Mr. Biden do it? Will he actually um, say like, okay, we are now going to join after all, or we want to renegotiate, although the thing is already there, but we know if the United States says, let's negotiate, the other countries would certainly not, um, not say like, no. The interesting thing is, of course, if that happened, the TPP and the, um, the way that it is, in, in, uh, that it exists now, excludes China. But RCEP in it includes China. So if in the end the US comes back to the TPP, we would have two overlapping uh, trade agreements, huge trade agreements, which combine the US and China. And I am certain that um, business will find a savvy way of using this in order to, to, to breach, right? And that would be for me a positive event, uh, development. Although I know that, okay, you can have like different opinions about free trade agreements and you will not find a perfect free trade agreement that, that, that does justice to everybody. But if we find, if there's ways to breach this huge divide that's opening up, the gap that has been increasing between China and, and the United States, I, I, especially the ideological one, that would be, um, that would be a good development from uh, from my uh, from what i see because something that has been worrying me is just frankly speaking the the narrative especially from the united states coming like china is the enemy of the future i really don't like that narrative i mean you went so far that at the munich security conference the german uh, forgot who it was but one of the german uh, speakers uh, was reminding the american the us delegates that china is currently battling a horrible virus i mean um, we don't need all of us to, uh, I mean, let's not uh, over dramatize it. While at the same time, Nancy Pelosi was saying like, Europe, wake up. Um, China is not going to get any better. So this to me means that even moderate democratic uh, US politicians are on the, on, on the way of perceiving the United States as uh, sorry, are on the way are perceiving China as a serious real threat, and I think Europe, in a sense, is trying to maybe de-escalate. And I know that Japan also has every interest in de-escalating this conflict. Japan has no interest in a in a in a um, in a hot in a hot conflict somewhere around its uh, its islands. Uh, I know that ASEAN also has no interest in that, and I would like to bring them in because I mean, um, for the TPP and for the new RCEP, I mean, ASEAN countries were. Um, important, uh, important um, uh, countries, platforms of discussion and initiators of discussion. So I think um, Japan, but also uh, ASEAN will continue playing that role and trying to, maybe, if not mediate, then at least try to stay clear of this, um, of this rivalry. And when it comes to geopolitics, the question is what happens with the, some of the disputed islands? over here and the most important place of course which to me is the most dangerous one is still taiwan because it is an unresolved issue um i do i would not expect china to do anything anything dramatic and drastic and the, um but it is a, it is an an open wound that that's just there and that might um at some point become dangerous and the other thing is then you know navigation we know that uh, even though even if China is not going to um, put more claims on like the, the, the islands or even um, put claim on Taiwan, then it, it will certainly continue to build up its uh, naval forces. And that's also an, uh, something that, is, um, that the United States is um, allergic to. And these two have been playing with their mutual kind of freedom of navigation uh, uh, maneuvers. They've been playing with each other. And I just hope that the, the, the other states around will also find ways to kind of, you know, uh, make sure that this doesn't accidentally escalate into something. Um, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Nadia, I'd also be talking about the One Belt, One Road initiative, which is also, of course, part of a foreign policy, at least of um, China, not in the sense of geopolitics, not in the sense of probably um, military and, and territory, but of course, the uh, economy plays a big role there as well. Um, let's discuss this maybe afterwards when I also want to give you the possibility to, re to react towards each other before we go into the discussion. But uh, last but not least, I would now uh, turn to 
to Heinz, and I would like you to, to ask more about the direct implication of Biden's election for the world. I mean, it was mentioned before, we have global problems, we have the pandemic, we have uh, international terrorism, we have the climate change, cyber wars, etc. So all these issues cannot be fought alone. So my question would be, and it was also mentioned already before by, by Louisa, that especially Biden uh, is known for his engagement when it comes to, when he, when he was still a senator in his political life, he was in Bosnia, he was in the Balkans, he had a focus there, he even went to Cyprus. So what do you think? Will Biden try to re-seize its leadership role, the, the leadership role in the U.S., also when it comes to foreign policy? Will he really strive for more multilateral agreements, maybe in the fields of disarmament? I mean, climate was mentioned. What do you think? What does this mean for international institutions? And also, I mean, the, the role of trust we have not been talking about, but it might be very important also, like how can we trust also an international leader and what would be the focus? Um, Heinz, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, for moderating it. I also want to thank the International Institute for Peace for organizing this series uh, of events uh, on the U.S. Um, at the end of my presentation, I will answer your question. Uh, but before that, I think I have to look back a little bit and I will uh, talk about the past role of the U.S. in the uh, world politics. Then uh, look at Trump's legacy, what he left for Biden, uh, then the future role of the U.S. Uh, in, in uh, uh, world affairs. And finally, I come to your question, what we can expect from a, a Biden uh, foreign policy. Uh, we, since uh, the 70s, uh, almost every 10 years in the U.S., we have a debate about uh, decline uh, of the U.S. as a major uh, power. So already Henry Kissinger was mentioned, she was mentioned already, I come back to him later as well. Uh, in the 70s, uh, found out that there is not only one superpower, the US, but we have uh, five great powers. Uh, of course, the US should be the primus inter pares, uh, but there's also Japan, uh, Russia, China, and, uh, and uh, Europe. Uh, a decade later, about uh, the historian uh, Paul Kennedy wrote his famous book, The Rise and Fall of uh, great uh, powers, and it raised so much f fear in the U.S. that he was invited to the uh, Senate for a, uh, for a hearing. Uh, at the same time, probably everybody knows him, uh, Joseph Nye said, no, 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 that's not a real decline. Uh, this, the U.S. is still bound to lead, and um, this is only an offset. The, the loss of American share in world uh, uh, economics is only an offset by uh, Japan and Germany uh, of their destroyed uh, uh, economies in the Second World War. Nevertheless, uh, there was a book, by an uh, influential book, um, by the head of a private uh, intelligence uh, organization, George Friedman. So he saw the uh, war with Japan coming. So the war didn't come. Uh, but what came uh, was the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, the, the, the Warsaw Pact. And then uh, this political scientist, Charles Krauthammer, discovered the unipolar uh, moment uh, in the world, uh, which was followed by an uh, uh, unfettered uh, globalization during the uh, Clinton period, but that included, of course, what uh, Louisa mentioned already, uh, the NATO uh, expansion, and the NATO expansion somehow was explained by the idea of enlargement of democracies based on the idea democracies don't uh, fight uh, uh, democracies. George W. Bush retreated from multilateralism. He went before the Iraq war, before the United Nations, and told them, either you are with us or you will be irrelevant. Uh, Barack Obama tried to restore somehow multilateralism as much uh, as possible. And now we are uh, at the legacy of Trump, and it was mentioned already that he, of course, abandoned much of the multilateralism uh, we know. He left the multilateral uh, agreements, discarded um, treaties, uh, and um, depreciated international uh, institutions. So that's known. But at the same time, we have a emerging, which is not emerging, which was here already before, uh, great power uh, competition, which is enshrined in basically all of the uh, US security strategies. Great power competition means that China is 
are considered to be an uh, economic and political threat, and Russia is considered to be a threat because it uh, has uh, uh, nuclear uh, weapons. So we have a situation now with increased polarization, great power competition, uh, increased poly, uh, polarization with less multilateralism. So the multilateral cushion, uh, the network is not there anymore. This is a distant uh, reminder of the late 19th century when the concept of Vienna broke down and uh, the alliances uh, for, before the First World War was uh, were, were taking were taking uh, shape. Um, the Europeans were disappointed uh, because they saw that the U.S. Uh, discarded multilateralism. The United States had to build up after the Second World War uh, themselves, and multilateralism is a big value uh, for the, especially the effective multilateralism, a big value for the uh, Europeans. And the Europeans over time. Uh, built up a very positive image of the United uh, uh, States uh, because the U.S. intervened in both world wars. It was the leading uh, Western power against the uh, uh, Soviet uh, bloc, and uh, it provided martial aid uh, after the Second World War to, to some of the European countries. Uh, in, in the face of the brutalities of the Vietnam War, the Europeans closed both eyes. However, that was not really possible anymore in 2003 uh, in, in, uh, at the, uh, during the intervention of the Iraq War was fought under false pretenses. So the mass weapons of mass destruction uh, were, not, uh, were not there. Um, so... Um, during the, this whole period, again, we have Joseph Nye, who always tries to rescue the uh, image of the United States and with his concept of soft power. And he refers to the, that the U.S. still is attractive because it has the best universities in the world and hosts uh, high-tech companies and exports uh, popular culture. However, the soft, soft power, and that was very visible during the uh, Trump administration and the corona crisis, uh, is very selective. So basically, it just doesn't look in the, at the social is, issues. So and the dysfunctional health system, inequality, uh, the structural uh, police uh, violence, uh, um, the crumbling infrastructure, dying cities, underfunded high school. So it was a very, so they, they are somehow lost attractiveness. Uh, not only within the country, but also uh, uh, abroad. So the debate about decline now goes beyond the economic uh, dimension and includes um, social, cultural, and uh, political uh, aspects as well. So uh, just to be clear, decline in this context doesn't mean that the U.S. would lose the great power status. Uh, it means that the U.S. would lose it's uh, self-declared exceptional uh, a statehood as an indispensable uh, superpower. So it's it's a, a sort of return, as Louis, Louis always mentioned, a return to uh, norm normality. So we cannot expect um, the an US-dominated uh, world that it will be res will restore uh, a rule-based uh, order. Uh, however, there is some danger coming with this situation now we have. So uh, the historian Graham Ellison found out that in about 75% uh, of the cases when we had a similar situation of a hegemonic power and a rising power, in 75% this situation would lead to a major war. So that is not necessary. We can have bipolarity without a major war as well, as we have seen during the Cold War. But if Bush comes to shove and it's really there will be a military conflict between the US and China, so what would the, the Europeans do? Uh, would they be uh, entangled in the great power conflict, which is not in their own interest, or would they stay uh, uh, neutral? So finally, uh, Stephanie, coming back to your question, uh, what can we expect from, expect from Biden's foreign policy? Uh, so Biden will not bring back American exceptionalism. 
So that's a wrong expectation some Americans uh, might uh, might have. Uh, he will, and that was uh, mentioned already by Hannes, return, partially return to multilateralism, join some, uh, again, uh, international organizations, World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, trying to come back to the Paris Climate Accord, uh, but there will be no international treaty anymore. Uh, international treaties require two-thirds majority in the Senate, so that will be not possible and not also not probably possible for the uh, climate uh, uh, climate accord. But however, the President Biden could um, use presidential uh, directives, which can be abandoned, of course, after immediately uh, when the next uh, uh, president will come in. Uh, so what will stay? Uh, great power competition uh, uh, will uh, remain. And uh, because it's structural, as uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned by, by, by Luisa as well, it's, geo it's geopolitical. But Biden, what Biden will do, he will look at, the, at multilateralism mainly through the lenses of allies, allies in Europe and allies in Asia. Europe means NATO. And at the same time, he speaks about an alliance uh, of uh, democracies, let alone the difficulties to define uh, democracy. But this uh, would, by definition, uh, undermine uh, a classic multilateralism. It would not be comprehensive, comprehensive it would be uh, exclusive. So Biden's world will be more diplomatic, uh, but not necessarily uh, much more cooperative. It will remain competitive. However, uh, to at the, at the end, two historic uh, maybe an analogies, one historic analogies, one suggestion. Uh, Biden could look at what Henry Kissinger and Nixon did in '72 uh, when they went to Mao's China, and this was the most uh, successful uh, summit uh, in the. Uh, post-war, post-second world, world war uh, period. And in this uh, interview, uh, Luisa mentioned, uh, Kissinger also says, uh, Biden should engage with China. So that's his, it's a distant reminder what he did in, in 72. And the second uh, suggestion I would have, so he will, because uh, Hannes mentioned this, uh, he will be, he, he promised to return to the nuclear, Iran nuclear deal, the GC, GC, uh, BOA. So there will be lots of intricacies, uh, involved, technical details, what are the, uh, conditions. And the Congress, uh, will, uh, is, uh, will oppose many of, uh, the, uh, uh, the lifting of the sanctions. Uh, in order to avoid this, uh, Biden could also do a big step. Uh, he could go and recognize uh, Iran diplomatically. So that could then the GCPA could be saved on a political level without be being involved in all these uh, technical details which might uh, come up in the uh, debate. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heinz. So you see probably a little bit more diplomatic, but still competitiveness will be prevailing even after buying. Um, my question would be now for, for all the speakers, if you would like to add something. I mean, Luisa, you started first. Maybe you, you have the feeling you would like to add something on what the others have been saying, or um, I would give you the opportunity right now. And then, of course, afterwards, we would have uh, already questions are coming in. So, but please, Luisa, please add. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and um, just, you know, I'll be very brief because I see that there are indeed lots of interesting questions already. Um, I, I think I'll just, you know, kind of um, emphasize what what the other speakers have said and and how um, Heinz closed because I think um, it, it would be an illusion to expect some more, you know, open collaborative geopolitics to emerge. Um, I think if anything, and I think um, all of you have been saying this in part, uh, the Biden presidency will insist on the EU being more geopolitical. But what that means will be a very particular sort of geopolitics, not necessarily the sort of EU geopolitics that I certainly would like to see. Um, so it's not going to be necessarily a collaborative geopolitics. Um, if anything, I think the Europeans will be reminded 
of the Chinese and the Russian threat and the need to take them seriously. Um, so there will be a push to a harder, you know, kind of geopolitical stance, whether this is in the interest of the EU or not. Um, so I think that's something to very much keep in mind. Um, and one, you know, w- one other thing to add here um, is that, of course, with, I mean, you know, we've already hinted at this, there are very different visions within the EU and the domestic divides um, that we identified in the US that will be, you know, kind of uh, um taking the attention certainly of the early months, if not years of the Biden presidency are very much present in the EU. I mean, how can we talk about a consistent policy towards Russia or China, um, you know, when we're dealing with states like Poland and Hungary right now, and when we, you know, we are unable um, to act consistently, coherently within before starting to even project a consistent, coherent geopolitical vision. Um, I will just say one last thing for those of you interested in, you know, a kind of uh, European response um, to what sort of geopolitics we can imagine now in the post-Trump era, I would strongly urge everybody to read this very long interview with Emmanuel Macron on uh, Le Grand Continent, which is this wonderful geopolitics magazine um, published in, um, in French and German, I believe, in several other languages, including Polish. And, you know, I mean, uh, Macron has his own very distinct vision of what a European geopolitics should look like and what a European foreign policy should look like. But I think it provides an interesting counterpart to this discussion. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Luisa. I don't know, Hannes, do you want do you want to add something? Maybe also, I mean, we remember that uh, Ursula von der Leyen also seemed to understand that the European Union should be more geopolitical. I mean, this is what she was saying when she was entering office, but of course you also mentioned the differences between the European countries when it comes to the perceiving of threats. I mean, that's very different for Poland and the Baltic states than, for example, for Spain or, or, or Italy. Or, but Hannes, please. Yes, and I would like also to take up at least one of the questions already come in. But my first remark is going to what Pascal said about the, the Asian free trade zone. It very much depends the development also on how the United States and India can cooperate and uh, rebalance the situation. As far as I know, India is not part of this agreement, but it, it's open. And they, they said you can join. So if, of course, India and the US would join, it would be totally different. And India, of course, is in a different situation. It's a big competitor to China, but India has a common border with China. US has not. So. This is also, I think, an interesting thing. Maybe Pascal can, can come back to that as well. Now, United States and, and Europe, the difficult situation is um, we need the United States. I think Macron must also recognize it. But of course, at the same time, we should develop more uh, own resources and possibilities. Uh, I mentioned the, the uh, criticism of Macron uh, of uh, the German foreign uh, defense minister. But yesterday I saw, for example, that the defense minister wants to send warships to Asia in order to, you know, to help uh, defending the open sea in, in Asia. So there are many steps of going more geopolitically, even as far as going uh, to, to Asia. On the other hand, we need the United States because, and this is one of the questions, uh, somebody, um, I think Mr. Pempers asked uh, about an interview given or presented today in Austrian radio of the uh, president of North Macedonia that we need more United States in, for example, in the Balkans. And uh, I think Louisa mentioned uh, also the, the Balkan activities of Mr. Biden and also you, Stephanie, which is in a way strange. On the other hand, of course, if you have countries like Bulgaria who are members of the European Union, they have a lot of power in blocking decisions. So the European Union in some way needs the United States to put pressure on its own member states who are blocking uh, or vetoing uh, European geopolitical position and development. Uh, as a European, I'm strange. Why do we need the US? But the reality it is, and it's also concerning uh, Hungary or Poland, who have a very different position concerning, uh, of course, Russia. So without with Trump, you couldn't do anything because Trump was not interested. He wanted more money and the rest, uh, uh, you know, 
I don't want to the words he would use uh, uh, towards uh, Merkel and towards the European Union. So in that sense, I think uh, we should be very clear. We need a strengthening of geopolitical activities of the EU, but we need the United States. And we discussed it also recently, you will remember Stephanie, on the Eastern Mediterranean. There was also said, where is the US? We need the US here in order to solve the issues. Because if Cyprus, again, is blocking, uh, retoing some activities, uh, then we cannot inside the EU solve the issue. We need the US as a partner. Therefore, uh, yes, uh, transatlantic relationships still will stay here and will be necessary, unfortunately, because uh, in Europe, the divisions are too big. And Macron is nice uh, in what all he wants to do. But if you see to the reality, very often, if Macron speaks about Europe, he means France or French politics. And uh, therefore, um, we should, uh, we need somebody like Merkel in order to have a balance. But if Merkel leaves the political scene very soon, it will be very difficult to have some sort of who, who is balancing, cooperating with Macron, but also balancing. But nevertheless, and I think this is the major issue, uh, Europe, the, the, to have our stronger Europe is not in contradiction to have good transatlantic relationship in the country. We need both to have a more or less uh, valuable transatlantic relationship. We need a stronger Europe. Thank you very much, uh, Hannes. Uh, Pascal, would you like to add something or? Maybe, maybe just two very brief points. One, you mentioned the One Belt, One Road initiative that uh, China is, is, of course, like building and has been trying also actually to use as like a you know, soft power and say like, okay, we are going to connect Eurasia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That one is, it's developing, it's going, but it is absolutely clear that a lot of, especially Southeast Asian nations are very aware of the... Um, uh, the difficulty that come with these um, offers from uh, from China also for development aid and that goes together with the entire development aid game which I would also say like we have to keep an eye on for example Japan is doing a lot of its geopolitics through very targeted uh, aid projects let's say in Vietnam uh, trying to build a, um, uh, infrastructure ports that would then allow to circumvent any kind of future like uh, Chinese one belt one road kind of um, power structure right in order to make sure that um, that trade flow trade can still flow in to make sure that there's alternatives so why we see in in Asia a lot of countries cooperating and now having a free trade agreement we also see that this this rivalry among them isn't ceasing and China as well as Japan and also the United States are using aid very strategically the US for example um, strengthening its ties with Mongolia through aid uh, well promises mm. and 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 um, budget points in order to keep a f uh, or to, to have a foothold also in, in this region. So this will also continue. The second point I wanted I want to make is that we have seen in this in the past couple of years um, some um, developments under in international law which are extremely worrisome for example that we are going away from this agreement that we do not recognize uh, um, territorial changes that came about through uh, the use of force, Crimea being one and the other one being the Golan Heights. Uh, or the Trump Heights, uh, how they are now called, right? And this is this is a problem. This is precedence that I hope will other others will not jump on, and Biden will hopefully um, try to stop as well. Um, China, etc. Luckily enough, they are not part of. I mean, this, they don't seem to want to go that route. I mean, the, the China and also. Um, well, Japan and Southeast Asian countries are very, very keen on saying, like, we will not interfere in domestic uh, affairs. Uh, rule of law is important. Uh, whether that's an empty word or not is another thing. But they, they uh, keep, even China keeps saying that we accept the rule-based international order and we want to lead. I and mean, China says we want to lead. And that's something that then is being contested, of course, on the other hand. But the, uh, ecology, for example, is something that China has a very strong interest in pushing for its own um, domestic agenda and that is something that can be quite good and fruitful if it's not being perceived as a ploy uh, in order to undermine 
um, U.S. leadership in the world. Let's let's put it that way. So I would hope that we see some positive developments there. Thank you very much also about uh, talking about international law and the importance of actually following international law in order not to make it irrelevant in the future. Um, Heinz, um, I, would, I would already like to pose the next question directly to you because someone is asking, isn't Trump probably the only post-Second World War president who did not start a war nor escalate the ones already going on? Um, yeah, I, 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 I would want to come back to other questions as well, but uh, yeah. the, the question itself uh, is telling. Uh, does it mean that every president uh, in the United States have to start wars? Uh, because he didn't start a war, that, that's exceptional. But it's true, every president uh, in the, of the U.S. started wars. Uh, but he came close to wars. So he came close to wars and um, uh, it, it was... Uh, Hannes mentioned this already that for the last 10 seconds that he withdrew uh, the uh, bombers to bomb uh, Iran uh, for very profane uh, reasons that he thought it would cost him uh, the elections. Uh, but the same is true. He wanted to bomb in the lame dark period Iran again and was, according to his report by the New York Times, was uh, uh, held back. Uh, so, and he increased tremendously the war rhetoric. Uh, again, uh, uh, towards almost every uh, adversary. So the China, the last thing, but it was also Korea before he started the romance with Kim. So fire and fury. Then Iran uh, was an escalation towards short of war uh, killing uh, General Soleimani. So he wa wanted to provoke war. Uh, that said, it didn't happen. That's uh, maybe another story. We historians still have to look at it. Uh, however, I don't exclude that it will still happen in the lame uh, uh, period. So having said this, I would not uh, uh, um, uh, uh, say that Trump uh, would be an, uh, an, a, a, a peacemaker. So that would not really, uh, is not really the, the, the case. Um, in terms of Europe, and Pascal was um, uh, speaking, uh, and so what Europe needs is not more geo geopolitics. Uh, we cannot compete geopolitically with the US and with China. Uh, what Europe's need, Europe needs is more politics. So more international uh, politics. And if you uh, read the uh, EU global strategy, there's a lot in there. So it's not implemented. Uh, but uh, China, for example, as uh, Pascal mentioned, is working on... Uh, in multi, in, on multilateral levels uh, of all kinds, uh, politically, financially, uh, uh, mm -hmm. UN, uh, regional. Uh, so, of course, uh, Pascal, you are right. They want to shape it, but uh, other countries want it as well, so the multilateral discourse. Uh, so it's better to have a multilateral discourse in the, in, in the, in the institutions than a geopolitical confrontation. So it is possible to develop common values in multilateral institutions. We saw the Helsinki Accords of 75 when we at the height of the Cold War. It was possible uh, to find a common decalogue of values as well and, uh, and stress cooperative security in contrast to false enemies, uh, adversaries, what we see in the current uh, security strategy. More politics, Europe is absent uh, in the Middle East, so we had this Kushner-Trump plan. So Europe was not there. So I, I hope it can return uh, somehow. Uh, Korea, it was the Trump-Kim conflict and uh, uh, love affair. Uh, Europe is not there, there. Even so, it is said that your Korean, North Korean missiles could hit Europe as well. Um, then in the debate about arms control, uh, INF, Europe was silent, even so the missiles can hit Europe and if they deplo deployed uh, uh, again. So, and I, I mentioned uh, China already, no real independent China politics. So it is not geopolitics, it's politics where Europe has to get back. Maybe it's possible under uh, Biden, but as Louisa men mentioned, the Biden will have his own agenda to involve uh, the Europeans. 
So just uh, I just recommend to read the EU Global Strategy, which talks about strategic autonomy in all these areas. About North, uh, North Stream 2, um, does anyone want to take it up? Like how will Biden approach uh, North Stream 2, especially also when it comes down to, to the situation with Merkel? Who would like to take the question about Nord Stream 2? Hannes, please. We can try to answer. Well, I think uh, there will be no difference because if you look, uh, the Democrats in, in, in the Congress have been very, very severe on Nord Stream 2. So I think, um, yes, uh, it will be uh, a continuation of putting pressure on the European Union. Maybe a modus vivendi can be, be found. But uh, at least Biden will use it uh, as uh, making it clear that such strong investments uh, cannot be done uh, and decision cannot be done by Europe alone uh, without uh, consent. And especially because those thing too is a, uh, is a conflict inside the European Union again. It's a, it's a contested uh, project. Uh, and I want to come back to what um, in this connection what, what Hans said. European Union is not a state. European Union has no nuclear weapons. Uh, France has nuclear weapons and Britain, but Britain is now out. So one cannot expect from Europe, in, in the sense of European Union, the same thing a big power can do. It is much more limited in many events. Of course, uh, in, in Israel, uh, Arab, it is limited in many events because also of its history of the one hand the Holocaust, on the other hand, of course, uh, have been uh, uh, maltreating the Arab countries and deceiving Arab countries. So I think all the history of Europe and the presence of Europe is, is limiting the European Union in that sense. Um, yes, this, this is to this question. I think we should be very clear what we can do and what we cannot do. But if I may take up one question on, on Georgia, but other people, of course, can help me as well, and may even better. I think what we have to see now in, in Georgia, the Caucasus region, is that for the moment, for the moment, Russia is in a stronger position. Russia is the peacekeeper uh, and has pushed aside the United States and Europe out of the conflict, maybe it is good, because to be involved in this conflict is not so easy. And it will not be easy for Russia if we think that, of course, many Armenians say, well, what did you do? You did not really defend us. Formerly, Russia was not obliged to defend, especially not defend the Nagorno-Karabakh. But emotionally, many of the Armenians, of course, hope that Russia will be strongly on their side. But anyway, for the moment, Russia is in a stronger position there. Uh, it is probably that um, Biden will have a stronger position and interest on the whole region, also in the South Caucasus, but I don't think anybody will start a war with Russia on the South Caucasus. Uh, everybody will try to, to, you know, to soften the issue there. Um, things are changing, but not so much that uh, there will be a strong uh, new engagement of the United States in the South Caucasus. Thank you very much, Hannes. Since this question was also directly a, a reaction to what uh, Louisa said, I would also like you maybe if you can also add something on this question about NATO enlargement and, and how Biden saw it and, and also in, in the context of Georgia and military presence of the Americans probably in Georgia, what this would imply. Please. Thank you. And, and I guess I, I'll follow up directly on what Hannes was saying, because I, I, I very much agree with him. Um, I think, you know, um, it's unlikely that we will see, as you were saying, uh, European involvement there. But I do think that if there will be a change with the Biden presidency, that there will be a much stronger push for the EU to take action in its various neighborhoods. But there I would go back to what Heinz was saying, because the sort of action that will be favored and the sort of geopolitics that the EU may be encouraged to pursue, um, certainly in my perspective, is not the sort of geopolitics that I would like to see the EU pursuing. Um, so the question will be, can the EU take um, its global strategy seriously? Can it 
make it, you know, kind of operationalize it. I mean, it's beginning to do so. I mean, certainly, you know, kind of the structured defense collaboration that is being advanced through PESCO and other mechanisms that is advancing, but that is, of course, not sufficient. And that also speaks to just one element of this, you know, kind of an aspect of hard geopolitics that I think it will be difficult to kind of catch up on. And I don't think that's where we should be going. So, um, I mean, I would agree with um, Hannes's assessment of, you know, of what will happen in terms of engagements in the South Caucasus or elsewhere as well, or, or in the Eastern Mediterranean, or for that matter, in Libya. Um, and I think, you know, there will be a push for the EU to do more. Um, but what sort of push and whether the EU wants to follow that push, that's another story. But I, um, I wanted to connect this to another question that I saw in the queue, um, you know, why is it that we need the um, U.S. to push the EU to do things, whether internally or externally? Um, and you know, there was um, uh, a question regarding, you know, what you know, whether we need the U.S. to somehow push us to deal, you know, whether with external threats or internal problems, such as you know, um, illiberal regimes, if not directly extremists within our midst. I hope that is not the case, um, but certainly, you know, um, that has happened in the past. Um, I think um, certainly during both the Clinton years, but also the Obama years, um, Europeans were reminded of, you know, um, uh, the need to protect democracy also within their borders. And once more, I don't think we should need lessons, uh, certainly not from the United States emerging from the Trump years on that. But there is this um, temptation, let's put it that way. So I think that we may see a return of that as well. Thank you, Louisa. Um, there is another question I would probably pose it to first to Pascal. Um, it says that it was mentioned that there is a great uh, power competition similar to how blocks were formed at the end of the 19th century when the concept of Europe fell apart. The question is to actually to our speakers, but um, is another global war possible? And what would you say are the weak points where it could start? Maybe, Pascal, if you could start with that question. Of course it's possible. I mean, it takes a few pushes of a couple of buttons and then we have it. So the question is, how do we not make it? We, we, I think we are all in agreement, and that's true for the US, China and Europe, that we don't want it. But how do we not get it, right? There's this argument that the First World War, we were sleepwalking into it because of alliance structures and like, uh, you know, doing really, really weird things that uh, including all of the grandchildren of uh, Queen Victoria ending up on both sides of the war, right? Cousins, uh, cousins fighting against cousins and things like that, you know, just something that doesn't really make sense. But out of the nitty gritty of, uh, of politics as it happens at the moment, it all makes sense and follows logically. But in a, in, in a, in a great picture, it doesn't. And of course, it wouldn't make sense today neither. Um, one reason why the U.S. is important in order to push Europe is because Europe just doesn't have the mechanisms, the internal mechanisms to create uh, a, this unity. There is no Supreme Court that can shut up the states and then they have to follow once the decision is is taken. We, do, we just don't have the same, these mechanisms. And when we, when Churchill was like speaking in Zurich in 46, saying we need to create the uh, United States of Europe, that's still the European project in a sense, but we are not we're not integrated in the in the same way, right? We are integrated in a different way, in a much more um, loose structure. And that is a strength and a weakness at the same time. Um, and I would just like, I don't agree completely with uh, Hannes, but, uh, because it's true that the European Union is not a country, but it is also more than just a customs union. I mean, it has supranationality and it has the, the, the commission and we have Madame von der Leyen, who is, I mean, not nobody, right? The, so the, the, um, the, this makes Euro, the Euro European Union quite really, really special in the sense that it is toying around with the very concept of sovereignty which I think in this century is going to be quite important. It's also going to import, be important for China. It's going to be important for the development of the, of the competition. What's going to happen with the idea of sovereignty, the way we know it, of who calls the, who calls the shots inside a, a certain territory? That's, I mean, maybe it, it goes too far, but it's something that I will certainly want to keep an eye on. Um, 
um, which says uh, um, there's a question about the views about the U.S. nukes in Europe. Should they be withdrawn or should they stay, and why? Um, who wants to start? The U.S. nukes, Heinz, please. Um. Yeah, the U.S. nukes are a legacy of uh, Cold War and uh, demonstrate, of course, the dependence uh, of uh, European countries from the U.S. because the uh, Europeans do not have um, the administration over this, uh, or the control over these uh, weapons. Uh, so they should be flying by European pilots, uh, uh, but they are not, uh, uh, cannot decide uh, when and where they should uh, be used. And uh, perspective uh, from Austria is that uh, Austria was very active in uh, concluding this uh, ban treaty, the treaty on the prohib prohibition of uh, nuclear weapons, which will enter into force in January 21. Uh, and uh, still many hope that even NATO countries could uh, join uh, this treaty because the Washington Treaty does not prohibit them to join, even so NATO declared himself in several summits we are a nuclear uh, alliance. Uh, however, as long as there are, there are these nukes uh, on the territories of European uh, countries, there is no way uh, that you can uh, come uh, to disarmament. Uh, but it shows another dangerous development we have it because in the past observers that, oh, they're not necessary anymore for, for deterrence. They're becoming necessary again because now we have the trend towards smaller nukes. You can read it also in the Nuclear Posture Review in the United States. Nukes with less uh, yield, which is still a big yield, but because they can, then they can be used much easier. So, and they can be used also against other weapons, conventional weapons, uh, chemical weapons. So it increases the possibility for the first use. Of course, it increases uh, deterrence, but it makes deterrence as a war fighting strategy and not a war preventing strategy. So these nukes are here also, uh, that they're same, in the same category, like the, just they're smaller, uh, like the um, medium range uh, weapons, which now uh, after the withdrawal of the uh, INF treaty are possible to be deployed in Europe and in Asia. They are smaller and easier to use. So I think they're very, very dangerous and they should not be igno igno uh, ignored. I would have a question. Um, how do you see the role of Macron with France in the future uh, in Europe regarding also taking into account Brexit and also, of course, that Merkel is on her way out? So. The, the question is about Macron and it's his role in the European Union and probably, I guess, also in the context of uh, the relationship with the U.S. Um, maybe Luis and Hannes. Um, who wants to sure. I mean, I can I can begin very quickly. And um, uh, I think Hannes very rightly pointed out that the kind of Macronist vision of European geopolitics is his own. Um, and a very French vision, and certainly a kind of geographically focused vision as well. And I fully agree with that. Having said that, um, you know, he is one of the few figures, um, and this again has a longer lineage, who has not been afraid to use the G word to speak about geopolitics and the need for the EU to act geopolitically, even before this commission declared itself to be a geopolitical commission. Now, of course, you know, what he means by that and what strategic priorities it brings and where France is seen as, you know, kind of playing a role is, you know, very distinct. Having said that, um, I think it's important to hear that because um, it's important to think that, yes, we need a coherent vision. Yes, we need to commit the resources um, to support such a vision and, you know, that's equally important. And especially, um, you know, we need to work first on internal divides. Um, and, you know, the proposals certainly, you know, will not be ones that uh, perhaps everybody will agree with, whether, you know, taking um, decisions without all of the EU states on board. Um, I mean, and that is, again, already happening right now with discussions of the recovery fund. And I think it's very important to, you know, to also look at, at um, internal EU politics, because those, you know, will hamper any sort of, you know, um, 
coherence of vision and unity of purpose, to use very geopolitical language, with respect to external challengers. So in that sense, I think, you know, the, the idea of the need to build a strong um, European vision supported by resources that he is advancing. Um, you know, um, he uh, he has been accused also of an almost, you know, kind of French colonial vision in, you know, the uh, tracing out the spheres where the EU should apply its influence, whether it's the Southern Mediterranean or beyond, or the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, yet he has been the, you know, the only one most forcefully standing up to, for example, um, Turkish um, naval exercises and so on, and has been um, the subject of attack before that. So, you know, um, I think um, uh, something we need to pay attention to, but of course, you know, we cannot see that as the EU geopolitical vision, which it clearly is not, but I will let um, Hannes add to this. Well, it's good that there are some differences. Uh, coming back, of course, also to what Pascal said, yes, of course, the European Union should do more and is more than a state. But the difficulty is always in the detail. And that uh, with France, uh, I, would, I would like that the European Union would have a stronger geopolitical orientation and France could make some contributions. France is a member of the Security Council. France has, uh, has uh, nuclear weapons and so on. But, uh, Louisa mentioned, France is, uh, still, uh, has still a very colonial orientation sometimes. Now there's a new alliance between the Austrian Prime Minister, Chancellor Kurz, and, and Macron in fighting uh, terrorism. But France is fighting terrorism in Africa, mainly military, in alliance with dictators who are de facto enhancing uh, uh, Islamistic uh, terrorist uh, groups in their own countries because they don't care about the, the citizens and the poorer uh, members of their country and therefore this gives ground for terrorism to be active. So one should look very, very specifically. Secondly, on Turkey, I don't think it is good for Europe to have only Turkey as an enemy. Maybe it is good uh, uh, to have a solution where the, the German position to try to mediate it is more helpful than the, the, uh, the domestically oriented policy of France. Because if you find energy uh, around Cyprus, my opinion is it, the benefit should be to all citizens of Cyprus. And the Turkish Cypriots are also citizens of Cyprus. So I think it is a bit of one sided. And Take the example of Lebanon. Uh, Macron was two days after the big explosion in Lebanon. I can understand to this, uh, here some sympathies, and, and the people in Lebanon were very happy he was here. But when he made his second visit, why didn't he take somebody from the European Union with him, the high representative, or somebody from the German presidency? I think the, 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 the ideas are good, but Macron is so oriented on himself and the Grand Nation that he destroys some of the good approaches uh, instead of promoting it. So my, my, if you read the speeches and also the, the other speech he, on defense he had, there are many good ideas. But France has to, to learn and Macron has to learn that if they want to be effective in Europe, they should take Europe with them. Uh, and it will be very difficult. Now, if you don't have um, uh, Merkel in Germany, but somebody else who is weaker, it will be even more difficult because there is no balance. And uh, in the Commission, unfortunately, uh, even uh, the present Commission president is in some way disappointing. And I know the High Representative many years, he, is not, he has many good ideas, but he's not the strongest personality to to say to some foreign minister, now it's a European issue and we have to act European. I fought for 20 years and, and more for a stronger European Union, but unfortunately, some of the leaders, they, I don't see enough progress going forward. Hopefully, a, a reasonable man in Washington who is challenging Europe is helping it because the challenge of Trump was not really helping. The challenge of Biden could help for Europe to go in a more, let's say, more 
uh, forward-looking and common and united position. I would hope very much this could be even a benefit uh, of uh, having Mr. Biden then uh, as alternative we had until now. I just wanted to say that, unfortunately, I think you are correct, Hannes. I mean, I um, both on, you know, I mean, Macron's vision being Macron's vision, very much a French vision. And, you know, it would be great, I mean, to my mind, if it could become a broader European vision. But I mean, there are limitations in a sense on both sides. And, and you know, and again, unfortunately, I agree, I do not see somebody who is now forceful enough, you know, to take that forward. And, you know, who knows what will happen even after the end of the German semester. I, I'm, I'm concerned about that on several fronts, if, you know, both the rule of law question within and even more so developments beyond. So, yeah. All right, since we are running out of time already, I have like one more question and uh, I would pose it to all of you. But of course, I mean, if it's already been answered, please just use the opportunity for your last message or the last thing you would like to add or what you think we did not discuss yet. And the question is, and I would actually, I would give it to you, Heinz. Um, the question is, considering that the Trumpian influence on the Republican Party, do you see any indicators of moderate Senate Republicans uh, for example, Lindsey Graham has been regarded as one of the bridges between the two parties in the past, working together with President-elect Biden on foreign policy issues. Um, that's your question. And please just uh, also, if you want to add something, what you think we didn't have been discussing today, use this last opportunity. And then I will also then give the floor then maybe backwards then to Pascal, Hannes and Luisa. Unfortunately, I have a very sober response uh, to this uh, question. So Trump has been elected, elected. He has got about uh, 74 uh, million uh, votes. So, and they do not disappear and Trumpism is not going to disappear. And uh, the Republicans uh, will not abandon Trumpism because they are afraid uh, for their own elections in the future. And uh, also my, Trump might uh, run for president again in uh, uh, 24, but also Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo is a strong uh, evangel uh, evangelicist, uh, sorry, <laughs> the conservative religious uh, 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 stream in the US. So he might uh, not want to lose the, elect the votes Trump got. So he will not uh, necessarily, so the Republicans will not necessarily uh, look across the aisles in order to find the common ground. Uh, I just want to remember uh, what happened when Obama has been uh, elected. So there was immediately uh, a fundamental uh, opposition to make uh, Obama as a one-term uh, uh, president. And uh, we had this Tea Party, uh, the Tea Party which was created uh, not with, with the arguments of a liberal economy and uh, debts, and uh, but uh, that was not the reason. That was an opposition uh, against Obama. A small states, how they argued, meant a small Obama. That was uh, we all had similar developments uh, in uh, in the past when Roosevelt uh, presented his New Deal. We had the Liberty League with the very same arguments. And uh, when Kennedy was elected, we had the John Birch Society with the same arguments it has been created already under Eisenhower, uh, but with the perspective that there will be a Democrat uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the White House. So there will be a stronger position. Uh, the Republicans most of the time will not abandon uh, uh, the Trumpism. Um, uh, as you, when you listen to these Republican statements now, they even many of them even don't concede that uh, Trump uh, lost uh, uh, elections. Uh, so the U.S. will remain a, a polarized uh, society, and um, the right-wing Republicans will stay right-wing, and uh, they will have uh, civil society is, is a positive term, but they will have support also by the civil society, by uh, some uh, so, uh, uh, conservative right, uh, uh, anti-abortionists, uh, 
anti-Obamacare, uh, all these arguments, they will stay, stay, stay here. So uh, we, Biden will not have an easy time. Uh, Trump uh, will use probably uh, also his power. He might uh, set up an, his own TV channel. And uh, so uh, Biden will have a very, very limited room of maneuver uh, to, to implement what he promised to do. So some possibilities uh, will, uh, we will use presidential directives, uh, that's, uh, that's possible, uh, but um, not many compromises, uh, neither in domestic politics nor in uh, foreign uh, uh, policies. And if the Senate remains in the hands of of uh, the Republicans, uh, so I don't. Of course, you have his rhetoric now, saying uh, that he looks across the aisle and from the United in, uh, United States. Uh, so that's uh, uh, not going to happen. One word more to uh, European uh, Union, as that has been discussed by uh, uh, Hannes and uh, uh, Luisa. Um, the European Union could basically do a lot without having nuclear weapons, or without having big geopolitical power. To some extent, I think that that's an uh, excuse uh, for doing uh, nothing. So getting politically engaged uh, in all these areas and the hotspots I mentioned from uh, Korea, China, arms control issues, uh, they, they can raise their voice. So, and a good example is the GCPOA. The GCPOA, you didn't need a united European position. That's all, all the, most of the time, that's an excuse for doing uh, nothing. You had a group which dedica was dedicated to get this agreement done. It took one decade to do so. It was an example of effective multilateralism of the European Union. Uh, if some uh, member states want to do something, they can achieve uh, something. So uh, geopolitics, uh, fine, but it's not a prerequisite for politics uh, and international affairs. Thank you. Anyone wants to say something else or one more sentence? Pascal, please. I just want to maybe very shortly, because in the United States, one thing that it will, will also not go away is the the thing that we couldn't really observe yet. We couldn't, um, uh, this new movement inside the Democratic Party, um, represented by um, people like Madame uh, or Ocasio-Cortez and, of course, Bernie Sanders, they never got to the real test. We don't know how Bernie Sanders would have done it. We don't know how big that one actually is. And that was also here to stay. And it's part of the fragmentation, of course, of U.S. Uh, politics. But because the current the system is such the electoral system is such that necessarily produce it necessarily produces two parties that are that are extremely big just like in the UK if we see changes to the electoral system happening then maybe there will be some more um, equal representation of the of, of US society because we know that it is not just black a red and blue we know that now we just it's it's hard to say like we're actually uh, where are these political, these real political opinions of people? Be because neither in the Senate or, or the House nor in the uh, nor in the presidency, there really there's a lot of diversity in there. But it is also here to stay. Um, so not just Trumpism, but also on, also the other side, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Hannes, please, yeah. Unmute yourself, Hannes. I was saying this. Yeah, there was also the question of uh, about Kamala Harris, uh, what role she would play, that goes together with the, the question on the role of the Republicans. So if in Georgia, which will be a miracle, but if in Georgia, the two uh, after elections could uh, go into for the Democrats, then there would be 50-50 in the Senate, and then Kamala Harris could play a big role because she has the final vote. She can decide which side is then correct. And I think some of the Republican senators uh, may be open to more, uh, let's say, a more um, 
constructive uh, situation. But for many years, and we saw it with Obama, Obama only count, for example, in the environment issue, could only do it with executive orders because he could not get support from the Congress. So probably that uh, is, is right, what, what Hans said. On the other issue, uh, we would have to have a, a discussion on the role what Europe could do. GCPOA was, was mentioned. The moment the United States gets out of it, it is in danger of breaking down. So I think even if Europe should act more, and it should act more in many, many cases, we need the United States to, be, to have an effect. Because otherwise you have these unilateral sanctions by the US, which is disgraceful, but it's de facto here. And therefore we, we need to such activities. Sometimes even the European Union is good in preventing worst cases. When we saw in Ukraine, and there was uh, uh, by a famous uh, lady uh, uh, active in, in Ukraine from the United States, and they were ready to send heavy weapons. Maybe it was good that the European Union at least said to the US, stop that, because we don't want a war with Europe here in the center of Europe. So yes, uh, uh, unfortunately, I would like to have a much more independent European Union. We should have a stronger position. But let's be very clear, in the Middle East, in the Middle East proper, in the situation in Iran, in the situation in Ukraine, uh, even now with Bulgaria uh, stopping uh, the negotiations with uh, North Macedonia, we need United States and it would be good and that is our hope to have a president who has more understanding for European interest than Mr. Biden had. Mr. you while being unmuted myself. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, and the last word goes to Luisa. Maybe you can also uh, still also um, take up the question which was posed, and I did not forget about it, about Kamala Harris being the first uh, female vice president in the U.S. Like, if this might also change the, the policy in the U.S., maybe also towards a more feminist policy and foreign policy in the U.S. But please also, of course, what else you want to say? as a last word. No, th thank you. And I'll be very brief because I, I realize we're running out of time. So, um, you know, as much as I would like to think that the EU can have an autonomous vision, stance and geopolitics, we need um, the United States to at least not be a problem, if not directly <laughs> support, um, you know, militarily or otherwise Europe's choices. Um, as far as the feminist foreign policy, which was the question, I mean, it's very interesting because some of you may be aware that there is actually a document that has been formulated for a feminist foreign policy for the EU that was proposed by the Greens in the European Parliament and has a lot of very interesting um, ideas that have been taken forward. And for those of you who are interested, we're actually hosting an event on that very topic this afternoon with colleagues who have been involved in drafting um, this document. Um, whether Harris is going to advance a feminist foreign policy, um, that remains to be seen. Um, I think um, it's wonderful that she can be vice president, and I'm looking forward and I'm hoping that she will take a more active role in the presidency than previous vice presidents have done. Um, but there, I mean, you know, we've been talking about the role of the US in shaping EU geopolitics, EU foreign policy. I would hope that you know, the passage could also be in the other direction. We never seem to think of that, of, you know, how the EU and EU institutions and EU ideas can shape U.S. foreign policy. So perhaps at least in this regard, we may have something to teach. But let's see. I'll leave it at that. We have a lot to teach, yes. To all of you for this uh, interesting discussion. Thanks to all participants who have been with us and who posed interesting questions. And uh, I think uh, also thank you, Luisa, for the last point. That was also quite um, interesting. We tried to touch upon many issues when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, we will see some continuation, but also, of course, not everything will continue as it was. So we will also need to find our way within this as European Union, but also, of course, in alliance at one point or when we share the same interests with China on the one and maybe with the OS and, and NATO and, and anything else. Um, so this was the last um, um, webinar in our US series. Thanks, Heinz, again for introducing. I wish you all a nice day. Uh, Pascal, to you, I wish you a nice evening. And um, thanks a lot. Enjoy and hope to see you soon in person. Take care and 
as we say these days, um, yeah, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Stay healthy. Bye. Bye. Bye.